Glory Cloud Podcast, Episode 37. Well, stay tuned, everyone. We've got a special guest on this week. Welcome back to another episode of the Glory Cloud Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Cahey, and I'm joined by your, our co-host, Charles Lee Irons. Welcome back, Lee. Hello, Chris. I'm so excited to be with you today. Yeah, I'm looking forward to today's episode for sure. Uh, before we dive right in, I'll just do the regular housekeeping, uh, reminding our listeners that we do have a show notes page over at meredithkline.com slash podcast, and you can find the resources that we mention in the course of the podcast episodes. We um, appreciate your five-star ratings on iTunes. That does help us get noticed as people look for good theological content on iTunes. And if you are benefiting from what we're doing and you appreciate it and you'd like to help us um, pay for the monthly cost of hosting the audio files, you can find a donate button at meredithkline.com slash podcast on the right-hand side of the page there. Today we have a special guest with us, the Reverend Dr. Brian Lee. Brian is the pastor of Christ Reformed Church in Washington, D.C., a congregation of the United Reformed Churches in North America. He earned his undergraduate degree from Stanford University, his graduate degree from Westminster Seminary, California, and his Ph.D. from Calvin Theological Seminary. He has also been an instructor at the campus of Reformed Theological Seminary in Washington, D.C., Today, we'd like to talk to Brian about the subject of his doctoral dissertation, The Covenant Theology of a 16th Century Theologian, Johannes Coxeus. Brian, welcome to the show. Uh, well, I'm thrilled to be here with you guys, and I always wondered what the glory cloud looked like from the inside, and so it's, <laughs> it's kind of misty in here, but it's great. It's nice to be here. Excellent. Okay. Um, so... Le- Let's just start out with um, a brief or biographical uh, sketch of Coxeus. Who, who was he? Sure. Um, well, I got to start off with a correction. You said he's a 16th century theologian. And uh, even though I'm a historical theologian, I'm not a real historian, as Dr. Godfrey and others always remind me. Um, these, these, he's a 17th century theologian. So he was born in 1603. Um, and lived until 1669. And uh, Coxeus was born in Bremen, which is in northern Germany, in the Hanseatic League. So he's German-born, um, but he spent a lot of his career in the Netherlands. And as you know, this was sort of a, a Dutch golden age of uh, doctrine and theology. So he studied at Froniker, um and then returned to Bremen, taught for a while, and then he was a professor at Froniker from 1636 to 1650, and then he moved over to the University of Leiden, uh, which along with the University of Utrecht were kind of the two major uh, universities and theological faculties of the 17th century during that golden age. Um, He was, uh, like Meredith Klein, an Old Testament, uh, a Hebraist. Um, He's a great example of what folks often talk about as the the flowering of Christian Hebraism as Protestant divines uh, studied with a lot of uh, rabbis. They learned the Hebrew language. Um, There's a great flowering both in the 16th and 17th century. Um, So he starts out dealing with a rabbinical text, Old Testament text, but moves broadly into uh, theological works. His his, uh, collected works um, published in the 17th century are 12 huge folio volumes, um, really massive work on practically everything. Um, And then uh, he became notorious in the 17th century for being kind of the head of one of two parties. We'll talk about this later in the program. But there are debates in the church after the the Synod of Dort and the Arminian debates of the 16 aughts and 16 teens going into the 1650s and 60s and 70s there erupts another really significant debate in, in Holland um, between the Coxeans and the Futsians, uh, named after Gisbert Futsius, or Foot. Um, and it was funny, there's a, 
uh, I did a, a doctoral research in Utrecht, and there's a church history museum there. And if you'll believe it or not, there, there is actually in that church history museum tea sets from the 17th century uh, with images of Coxeus and Fuzius on them. So you could buy your branded tea sets uh, to uh, pick sides in your debates between your two chosen theologians, a very different age in terms of uh, the role that doctrine and theology played in the life of the general church going public. But um, so that, that's why he's really quite significant. And, and really the reason we're here um, on this show talking about Coxeus is because he wrote in 1648 uh, a book called the Summa Doctrinae de Foidere et Testamento Dei. So the sum or uh, uh, the system of doctrine of the covenant and testament of God. And this is really seen as the first sort of summa, systematic theology organized covenantally from top to bottom. And so we could talk about whether or not that's accurate in a little bit as well. But um, that work really stands out and has, even for those that know very, very little bit about Coxeus, has identified him as a leading covenantal theologian of the 17th century, kind of a high watermark, I would almost say, of Dutch Reformed covenant thought. Um, and that book has just recently been translated into English. Uh, so Casey Carmichael did this translation by uh, Reformation Heritage Books. Uh, the Doctrine of the Covenant of God, I believe, is how they um, Englished the title. Um, and uh, so it's newly available. So uh, now I'm no longer one of only three or four people to have ever uh, hammered my way through that Latin text, and now a lot of people will be out there uh, questioning everything I claimed about it. <laughs> Very good. Why then, why should we be interested in Coxeus's theology today? That's a great question. Um, I was uh, put on the track of Coxeus by someone I'm sure a lot of listeners know, uh, Robert Godfrey, and, and he said that he was a curious figure who hadn't really been studied that much. And as has often been the case, a lot of what we know about the Reformed tradition has come through English language materials because a lot of the English Puritans were far more easily read by scholars and laymen and pastors today. Um, and so Coxeus, as I already suggested, is one of the real architects of Reformed federal or covenant theology. He does have a, a really distinctive view of the relation between the Old and New Testament, uh, between the Mosaic economy and the New Testament in Christ. And I think, you know, with the topic of republication, as this has been debated in the last 10 or 20 years, um, I, I think Coxeus and the Coxean Fuzian debate gives us a model of how the Reformed churches dealt with very, very similar topics, um, you know, three, four hundred years ago. And um, just the, to give the headline to that, they decided that there is a lot of variety on where you might come down on particulars of covenant theology that is really sub-confessional. In other words, we can have a lot of disagreements, but we should have a lot of tolerance um, and, 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 and it might drive a lot of debate. It might stimulate a lot of creative thought on both sides of the aisle. Um, but my uh, great takeaway is that the coxane fuzian debate tells us that, hey, we should really tolerate a lot of diverse opinions. Go at the text, hammer and tong, have, you know, rejoice that we can, you know, struggle together to see Christ in the pages of Scripture um, but also understand that that we didn't divide the church in the 17th century like we did with the Arminian debate. This is below that level and and should really stay in the house as a, a joyful opportunity to to debate God's truth. Very good. Well, first of all, Brian, I have to give you props for working your way through the Latin text of Coxeus's volume. That's amazing. <laughs> well, uh, I mean, if I could say quickly, um, I learned. Uh, to read Latin, funny as it is, with with the the Pope's Latin secretary in the in Rome, a, a man by the name of Reginald Foster, who who taught a lot of Americans over the years, and I spent a summer over there. And what I learned from Reginald was uh, how to skim a lot. And and I'll start by saying that that the the um, the text of the Summa Doctrinae, uh, 
was not the focus of my dissertation. I really focused on Coxeus's exegetical work, and particularly his Hebrews commentary. That's a little bit of a side story in itself, but um, my project was really a project focusing on exegesis, but I'm, I'm glad I'm going to go back and reread the Summa Doctrinae now because it's in English, mm. um, and and I was you know able to focus on what I needed to get out of it, but uh, you know how it is when when you study any text in a foreign language, uh, it's a different kind of reading. But yeah, I was I was trained to read a lot of material for general comprehension. If you ask me to sit down and write out a translation, uh, the kind of work that others have done, uh, that's not my bailiwick. Right. Now I'm vaguely familiar with Coxeus's idea of abrogations, where he starts off with the covenant of works in the garden, and then he progressively sees that covenant as being progressively abrogated throughout redemptive history. Can you explain what what Coxeus is doing with that idea? Yeah, and, and that's a that's a big question in Coxeus scholarship. Let me just start by saying that Coxeus is a little bit like Calvin in that he's really well known for the Summa Doctrinae, um, like Calvin's well known for the Institutes, right? But he expresses himself in a lot of different places in biblical commentaries and a lot of different polemical works. And the abrogations really only shows up clearly in the Summa Doctrinae. So it's, it's associated and it's really popular because it's an organizing principle of, of the, of his main work. And I think for about a hundred or 200 years, people really didn't read much Coxeus at all. And they, if they glanced at the Latin text and didn't just read an encyclopedia article, they might have seen the chapter headings, which talked about these five abrogations. Um, on closer examination, I don't know that it's really the centerpiece of all of Coxeus's thought. And I'll, I'll flesh that out a little bit. But yeah, to your point, he, he basically starts with the covenant of works in the garden, as covenant theologies often do. And then he, he talks about how in five stages – um, we are kind of um, move from the covenant of works into the covenant of grace as that which governs our relation with God. So the first abrogation, to give an example, let's say, in terms of its ability to give us life, the covenant of works promised life, but man's sin, you know, made worthless the covenant of works to that end. Once we're sinners, it can no longer give us life. So that's the first abrogation. And the second abrogation is that the covenant of grace is announced. And so we are moved into the covenant of grace as the way of gaining life. And then the third abrogation is the actual arrival of Christ and the announcement of the new covenant, which makes us relate to God now in a fully sort of consummated new covenantal way. And then the fourth abrogation is that our our day-to-day struggle with sin is ended by the death of our body. And then the fifth abrogation is that the resurrection of the dead um, sort of puts an end to that. The resurrection of the body brings us into a new relationship with God in Christ, totally dominated um, by by the covenant of grace or or organized or governed by the covenant of grace. Um, It's really interesting, just if I could say a few things about those five abrogations, that – that the terms, the relationship, he's trying to relate works and grace in the life of the believer. So before we get hung up on these five stages, I think it's just really important to say that this is a kind of a fundamental conversation about how we relate to God via law and gospel. Um, And this is what covenant theology has always done in the Reformed tradition. It's been a way to try to look at the whole of biblical revelation, Old Testament and New, and see how law and gospel are both operating in a different ways phases of scripture. Um, And then I I could say more, and I'll let you prompt me if you want to, um, but I I do think that it's gotten a little bit too much abrogation. I I think there are too much attention in Coxeus scholarship, especially by kind of casual readers of Coxeus. First of all, because it's not found that prominently in his other works. And second of all, I think the five abrogations basically break down to two. Um, and, and what looks like it's a way of relating the covenant of works and the covenant of grace really rotates a lot around the second and third abrogation, which means the covenant of grace in the Old Testament and the covenant of grace in the New Testament. And so it's really a way of talking about um, how the two testaments 
relate to the believer and his relationship to God and how grace is revealed in Old Testament by anticipation, in New Testament by fulfillment in Christ. And as we move into the later works of Coxaeus, so the covenant, uh, this work is 1648 in its first major edition. He writes another summa, actually. He has two summae to his uh, credit, a summa theologiae, using Aquinas' title. And that summa is organized much more around Old Testament, New Testament, and parsing the believer's relation in those two phases of God's revelation. And so it's very interesting to me that as we look at his later works, the fivefold abrogations really fades away. They don't really stand up to much scrutiny on their face. Uh, they're really mostly about that Old Testament, New Testament relation. And so I, I think over his career, he might have had this idea as an interesting way to organize covenant thought. But over his career, he came to the view that the real issue is how do we think about the believer in the Old Testament, both under Abraham and under Moses? And how do we think about the believer in the New Testament with the coming of Christ? So if you were to summarize, what would you say are um, you know, the, the, the highlights of how he would parse out uh, those differences between the Old and the New Covenants? Well, you know, I, I think one of the most important things, and, you know, it's always fun, and you know, I'm sure you guys had this experience when you read Scripture in Greek and Hebrew. Sometimes when you come across something in a different language because you're moving more slowly, it kind of smacks you upside the head in a more powerful way. And, and somewhere in Coxaeus, he, he claims that when Christ is baptized in his ministry and his public ministry begins, and Mark says he goes and he begins preaching the gospel of the kingdom, Coxaeus is very clear to say that the gospel is being preached for the first time. So um, I think what Coxaeus is doing, and this seems like a similarity with Meredith Klein, as I studied under him, is he is underlining and emphasizing the difference between promise and fulfillment. In other words, he is kind of maximalizing the contrast between the Testaments while not while still trying to provide a means of understanding the hermeneutical continuity. Um, but for instance, he comes to Hebrews chapter 2, and he says um, that Jesus has you know, destroyed the one who had the power of death, so that we would no longer have to live in the fear of death. And he says, even covenant believers in the Old Testament, even those who experienced the grace of the promise of the coming Messiah, had a kind of fear of death that we do not have in the New Testament. And so he'll say, you know, if you broke God's law, if, if you spoke back to your parents, right, and there was that threat, maybe it wasn't actually put in practice too often, but that, that threat that you would be stoned, like there were actual sanctions hanging over you that punished death. And he's like, this is a big deal. Like we have incredible freedom in Christ that is different in our New Testament experience. And the, this actually tees me up for the single biggest probably debate in the coxian Futsian uh, war of words was over the difference of how New Testament saints and Old Testament saints experience justification. Mm. And so he latches on to the contrast between two Greek words that we find in the New Testament, paresis, or the passing over of sins, like we see in Romans 3, and aphasis, which is often translated with forgiveness or a full removal of sins. And so he says, the Old Testament saint had their sins passed over. They knew that the promised mediator was standing as uh, someone between them and the punishment of their sins. And yet, because he hadn't yet come, they were still, in a sense, aware of them. Whereas that removal of sin, that the announcement of forgiveness is much more robust and free. And so you could see how this would drive his opponents wild within the Reformed camp. What, you mean David didn't have forgiveness like we have forgiveness? You mean Abraham? You mean Moses? Um, and so that's the terms of a debate that sometimes we hear playing itself out, I think, some echoes today. Mm. Well, that's really interesting. Mm. Yeah, just, just to uh, help our listeners out a little bit here, let me just quote from Romans 3.25 so they can understand what 
Brian is referring to here. It says, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over. That's the, the word parasis there. He passed over the sins previously committed. And so that's that's a distinct word in Greek from the word "offices," which is uh, the word for translated usually forgiveness or remission of sins. And here in Romans three twenty five, it's referring to the old covenant time period, and it's seeming the implication seems to be that prior to the coming of Christ, prior to the propitiation in His blood, that what God did in His forbearance was to pass over sins, but not to forgive them necessarily. That seems to be the implication according to Coxeus's interpretation. Yeah. And and he picks it up in Hebrews chapter 10 too, where he says, now that we have forgiveness of sins, there can no longer be the shedding of blood. So, um, which is a really interesting conversation. The shedding of blood and the whole sacrificial system was testimony that sins had not yet been fully forgiven. Right. So the, the shedding of blood is for Coxeus, the witness that there is still some major work to be done. And so when he, he really keys on that quotation in Hebrews 10 that says, forgiveness has now come, which is to say, in a sense, there was not this full declaration of forgiveness as long as blood was being shed. And mm-hmm. so it works both ways. He takes the corollary both directions, mm-hmm. which is really fascinating. You think, wow, that Old Testament saint didn't have that same experience that we have. Mm-hmm. Um, and part of that was they had to go and get their hands really dirty and wring the necks of chickens. And, you know, they had to deal with all that stench. And, mm-hmm. uh, and you know, I think sometimes we have a very abstract, rarefied, philosophical thought of how the Old Testament and the New Testament related it, and he gets very concrete about it. Mm-hmm. So, in the verse you just quoted from Hebrews, Hebrews 10, 18, that uses the word offices, right? Forgiveness. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, it's saying where there is offices, where there is forgiveness, there is no longer any offering for sin. But the fact that there was offering for sin in the Old Covenant shows that offices had not yet been brought in. That's interesting. So, is he saying that this is this distinction between uh, passing over and forgiveness? Is it a is it a distinction of something objectively different in terms of the ordo salutis, or is it something subjectively different that their experience of forgiveness is different? Yeah, that's a, a wonderful question, and that really gets to the heart of what the debate is about. Um, you know, I, I think Coxeus wants to really emphasize, and, and he has a work dedicated, and he says the utility of this distinction. And for Coxeus, the whole, what's really driving him to talk about this distinction, a big part of it is polemics with Jews. Mm. The the 17th century, and, and then he, he extends that to Roman Catholics and Socinians, who were the big debate partners, the polemical debaters of the 17th century. And, and he, course, knew, he had a lot of interactions with Jews, right? He knew Jews and studied Hebrew with them and so on. I believe so, yes. And, yeah. and the important thing, of course, is that Holland is a, a beacon of tolerance in the 17th century. Hmm. So you have Jews living there. Spinoza comes there. Others come there. Um, you have uh, Roman Catholics living in Holland because they're tolerated to a different way than they are in different countries. And you have a lot of the Sicinians, which were the quote-unquote Polish brothers, Faustus Socinus. A lot of them came from Poland to Holland because mm. they were tolerated there. So there was a lot of cheek-to-jowl polemical work. Mm. And he actually, in, in the work that I focused on his Hebrews uh, commentary, he has this whole dedication where he he makes fun of his Futsian opponent, his sparring partner, who wants to insist that Old and New Testament agree, that God's law is identical in the Old and New Testament, that the Sabbath is identical in its observation in the Old and New Testament. And 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 Coxias comes back and he says, well, then how are we going to tell the Jews to become Christians? <laughs> and wow. it's, it's, it's sort of an obvious point, but he says, you know, so you go all the way back to the beginning of the Reformation, you go all the way back to Heinrich Bollinger. And Bullinger writes the first monograph on covenant in the Reformed tradition. Mm-hmm. And what is the title of Bollinger's monograph? On the unified covenant of God. 
So Bollinger is arguing against the Anabaptists for the unity of the Old and New Testaments. And then you come to Coxeus, and he's like, we have a different polemical partner. We need to now argue for discontinuity. Mm. We need to argue for the difference before and after the coming of Christ. Because you know what? Roman Catholics are doing old law, new law. We have to say, no, it's old law, new gospel. Mm. And the Socinians are saying, law, law, Old Testament law, New Testament law. And he says, no, we need to do Old Testament law, New Testament gospel without losing the fundamental unity of the scriptures, which is always that unity found in the grace of Christ, found in the common mediator and the covenantal structure of the Old and New Testaments. So, so it's it's really interesting. This is baked into the Reformed tradition. And even Coxeus comes around and says, my opponents say there's only one testament. They talk, they talk about Heinrich Bullinger, but Bullinger's talking about something else. We have to emphasize the Apostle Paul says in Galatians that there are two testaments. Um, and, you know, Coxeus has the upper hand exegetically, I think, um, doubtless, you know, and he points to Hebrews 8.13, which is where this idea of the abrogations comes from. The Old Testament is fading away, it is becoming abolished, or it is abrogated. And so, what is the author to Hebrews talking about? And that was the verse that started my whole dissertation, really, how Coxeus dealt with that verse. And then I looked at how every Reformed commentator from the 16th through the 17th century dealt with that fundamental covenantal idea at the heart of the book of Hebrews. Yeah, which verse are you referring to? Well, Hebrews 8.13, um, I don't have it up in front of me, but it's where after the author to Hebrews reads through the Jeremiah 31 passage, the promise of the new covenant, and then he holds out, um, you know, he says that that old covenant has, well, it depends on what your translation is, but uh, in speaking of a new covenant, I think this is ESV, he makes the first one obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Sometimes we see the word abrogated there or abolished, mm, okay. uh, depending on our translation. So that idea that are there is there one covenant or two fundamentally in Scripture? Well, um, you know, Jeremiah 31 and the author of the Hebrews talks a lot about a new covenant and an old, and the one is vanished when Christ arrives. So how are we going to deal with and describe that tension? Mm-hmm. Well, this is so interesting just to see these, uh, these debates and tensions within Reformed theology between those that emphasize the oneness of the covenant of grace and saying that the two, the old and the new covenants are just different administrations of a single covenant of grace and those that really want to say, no, there's something new here. The new covenant really is a new covenant. (laughs) Yeah. And if I could add, if I could add one thing about that general observation, um, Richard Muller, who was my dissertation advisor makes the point that, um, scholastic theology, and, and there is a kind of reformed scholasticism. Yeah. Um, and, and Coxace is doing, you know, wrongly, we've pitted biblical theologians against scholastic theologians. Coxeus is doing biblical scholastic theology. Interesting. And, and scholastic theology almost requires Latin as an incredibly technical language. And, um, and Coxeus's covenant theology is incredibly complex at points. It's almost Baroque in its complexity, which is the appropriate period, right? The 17th century. And and it doesn't work in English. I think one of the real problems in the Reformed tradition, and the reason that we will still be debating these issues when Christ returns, is that when theological debate shifts over in England into the English language, or for that matter, in Holland into Dutch or into, into German, it can't maintain the scholastic precision that Coxeus is deploying here. And I, when I read English debates about covenant theology in the 17th century, which I've spent very little time reading, I, I can't do it. <laughs> I get very frustrated because the, the terminology is so ambiguous. Mm-hmm. What do we mean when we say covenant? What do we mean when we say testament? What do we mean when we say pact? And Coxeus uses these three Latin words, all legitimate translations of the, the biblical berit and diatheke. He uses pactum, he uses foitus or covenant, he uses testamentum with really precise, finely tuned meanings. And it enables him to develop a very more complex, and this is all after the period of confessionalization, Mm 
um, even Westminster standards in the 1640s, really doesn't reflect the level of complexity that was finally attained in the 17th century. And we never reached agreement on it. It's just not something we ever nailed down. So there are a lot of different ways to talk about these biblical dynamics. And I just, you know, urge tolerance uh, in our contemporary debates because we have a lot to learn from each other, right? Yeah, absolutely. Now, you mentioned the word pactum, so that makes me think of the pactum salutis. And uh, sometimes I read in the literature, and you mentioned before that a lot of these are just um, sort of like English summaries of uh, high-level summaries of Coxeus's thought. But sometimes you read in the literature on the history of covenant theology that Coxeus is credited with being either one of the architects or the architect of that concept of the pactum salutis or the covenant of redemption. Would you say that that's an accurate statement? Yeah, and you know that is not an area that I studied in great, great detail. It is, it's a fascinating topic of, I looked at developmental issues, but who sort of gets the credit for that one? Um, another one of my dissertation advisors who I, I worked with very closely was a man who's now deceased, Willem van Osselt, a, a Dutch scholar. And he wrote a number of monographs on Coxeus, a number of articles. Um, if anyone is interested in going deeper, his stuff has been translated into English and is, uh, much of it has and is very, very good. He does not believe uh, that Coxeus introduced this notion of a pretemporal pactum salutis within the Godhead. Um, but he does think that he extensively develops its exegetical and theological implications. Mm -hmm. um, he talks about that a little bit in his preface. Um, van Osselt writes a great preface to the newly translated work of Coxeus. Um, I, I actually wrote an article on Coxeus's covenant terminology, and it's interesting as we think about the three major covenants in um, you know what we think of classic Reformed federal theology: the covenant of works, covenant of grace, and the pactum salutis, so the covenant between the Father and the Son and the Spirit in eternity. Um, again, we don't use really precise words, but Coxeus's terms for these three covenants are. Pactum salutis, foetus operum, covenant of works, and he prefers the term testamentum or novum testamentum, testament, for the for the new covenant that's announced. Um, and the interesting thing is he's using pactum, foetus, and testamentum for the three covenants in those three things. Now, of those three Latin words, a pactum is a, a, a meritorious agreement between two equals. Um, a foetus is most uh, predominantly kind of a treaty that shows some level of agreement and merit, but is not as merit-based as pact. And then a testamentum is a last will and testament or an inheritance or, or, or a, you know, a grant. And so it's very interesting that he's using three different words for the three different classic covenants of, of Reformed federal theology – and even when he's just speaking without thinking about it, he's getting different connotations out of those concepts, um, which is, uh, you know, something that, again, just a way that scholastic theology operates on a higher level than a lot of um, vernacular theology does. Interesting. <clears throat> did he see, the way Klein does, did he see that the Pactum Salutis and uh, the Novum Testamentum, the New Covenant, are interlocking in some way and connected? Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, he sees the um, the uh, the pactum salutis as the foundation of the uh, so what sort of the the announcement of the the proclamation or the issuing of mm -hmm. the Novum Testamentum. So the Novum Testamentum can be issued from heaven, you know, in, in the heavenly council, can come out of the glory cloud. Um, once the pactum is secure, mm. but, and this is where you get that important redemptive historical thrust, in a sense, it is awaiting the completion, in other words, the actual merit of the pactum, which entails the incarnation and the, the life, death, and resurrection of the Son. So, you know, you have this fascinating phrase in Hebrews 13, that Hebrews doxology, the blood of the eternal covenant. And if you just try to wrap your mind around that, like so much of the book of Hebrews that just sort of shatters platonic divisions between heaven and earth and time and eternity, you have an eternal covenant that's ultimately secured and founded upon temporal blood. 
um, about blood at all, <laughs> like real blood. <laughs> and and that's that's mind blowing, right? And yet that is the shape of of a triune God who actually you know engages in an imminent way with his creation in fulfilling his eternal promises. Mm-hmm. Excellent. So, Brian, you you mentioned three covenants that Coxeus recognized. Uh, Would you say that uh, he held to some version of the idea that the Mosaic Covenant was a republication of the Covenant of Works? Um. Yeah, I, I would say yes and no. And, and I, when I read Coxeus, or for instance, Witsius, um, who who follows Coxeus and. I can say more later about how Witsius related uh, to Coxeus because that's an interesting question. A lot of your your listeners might be more familiar with Herman Witsius, who's like a generation later, but he's been translated into English for oh, over 200 years now. Um, you know, this idea of the abrogations, that the covenant of grace is kind of evacuating the covenant of works, taking its place. Um, he starts that whole conversation in his Summa with Hebrews 8.13, and he says, 8.13 is not about the abrogation of the covenant of works, but it is about the abrogation of the ceremonial aspect of the Mosaic economy. But he draws a very close connection between these two things. He says, we can still see this idea of the moral law, do this and live. Um, It has a, a certain aspect of the content of the covenant of works, and it's a certain aspect of the Old Testament, that is the Decalogue and the Mosaic administration. So when scripture talks about Moses being abrogated, we can take that as one of the stages in the covenant of works being abrogated. So there's this fundamental point of contact there between the covenant of works and the Mosaic administration. And it's because it has this moral law, do this and you shall live, contained within it. Um, so they both contain that moral law, and after the fall, after um, – as one of their sort of stipulations, and after the fall, in the presence of sin, that moral law always works wrath. So in that sense, both the foetus operum, both the covenant of creation or the covenant of works, and the mosaic economy, that that administration, um, work wrath. Um, and yet – he he gets a little more complicated. I'll, I'll pause there uh, if you want to follow up. But he gets a little bit more complicated even than that for Coxeus. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you, if you'd like to say more, um, so well, so so again for Coxeus, I, I think at the end of the day, his primary concern is to think of of how sinners in the covenant of grace relate to God before and after Christ, how that changes. So the major category for him is always going to be the covenant of grace as it's announced and proclaimed in anticipation, in promise, and the covenant of grace as it's announced and proclaimed in fulfillment, the mediator, the testator, having come, having died, having given fully that grant of inheritance. And so in that sense, he sees the Mosaic economy as one of a series of Old Testament administrations that are all under the umbrella of the covenant of grace, very similar to Klein. Um, and he sees a lot of um, a, a lot of texture there. So there is the Abrahamic moment, and then even coming out of Egypt, um, Coxeus actually has this very curious bit where he says, right after they came out of Egypt. You know, the early chapters of Exodus, the people could have been obedient. They could have been faithful, obediently faithful, and not been in the wilderness for 40 years. It's very speculative, right? But he says they could have gone into the promised land and inhabited that on much better terms than they eventually did. And it still would have been a covenant of anticipation. It still would have been typologically related to the coming Christ. But he says, when the people break covenant in the golden calf, and when they they groan and complain, and when they put their Lord on trial at uh, Massa Meribah, they, they are breaking covenant with God, and God imposes upon them a more rigorous 
covenantal arrangement, a more onerous sacrificial system than they would have necessarily have needed in the first place. So Coxeus has actually a very uh, a very loose sense of God had a lot of freedom in terms of what that Old Testament experience could have looked like, but it all would have been under the umbrella of anticipation of the coming Christ. There would have always been greater threat and, uh, and in that sense of sins that still need to be fully forgiven. The full forgiveness of sins has to hang for Coxeus on the incarnation and the shedding of, of that blood of the eternal covenant. Hmm. So it seems like when he's talking about uh, the abrogations that I hear some ideas that are very uh, similar to what Meredith Klein was talking about, but maybe he's not as comfortable um, articulating such a, um, a distinct um, works principle when he's talking about the covenants themselves. Is that accurate? No, I, I think he's, you know, it, it is, um, it's more, in a sense, it's more fundamental. He doesn't focus on the works principle per se, okay. because for him, he wants to say, Abraham, a saint under Abraham and a saint under Moses are both living by anticipation. They both have to deal with this experience of justification by paresis, by the, the passing over of their sins, and not by the full forgiveness. So in a sense, he he doesn't make the mosaic economy that distinct. But then in a different sense, he comes back and he actually says that when God puts a more severe uh, um, sort of covenantal structure over those people coming out of Exodus and into the promised land, uh, he points to Ezekiel chapter 20, that verse, I think it's Ezekiel twenty twenty five, where he talks about statutes that are not good and ordinances in which the people could not live. And he ties this in with, with the law in Hebrews chapter 7, where, where the author of Hebrews is saying very strongly, that law could not perfect you. That law could not give life. It was a weak law. And, and so that is where Cox is, I think, in some ways sounds very Kleinian in that he's willing to run with the mosaic economy as a negative expression of, of the people's relationship with God as reflecting their sin and their brokenness and really driving them and impelling them to Christ in a powerful way. Hmm. Um, so, but he sees Ezekiel 20, 25 and Jeremiah, where he says that he, you know, the Lord 31 brought them out and lorded it over them. He sees that as God really was a Lord, a ball over the people um, because they have shown how covenant breaking they were. And, and his point is not only are the people unable to fulfill the law of works, the people are without the Holy Spirit unable to fulfill the demand of faith. In other words, Coxeus wants to make believing as difficult as working, which, of course, we agree with, right? We need the Holy Spirit. And so that's where when Jeremiah 31, 31 seems to hint that it's only when the law is written on our hearts and the Holy Spirit comes. Yes, Old Testament saints had that promise, but in in fulfillment and consummation, that's a unique blessing of the New Testament. Mm. And so even the faithful recipient reception of God's gracious covenant requires all God. And so in a sense, the mosaic economy with all of its oppressive elements taught us not only that we are unable to fill the covenant of works, but that we are unable apart from the spirit of God to fulfill the covenant of grace, which makes it so important for the covenant of grace to be a, a, a testament where what we need is given to us, or even faith is given to us as a gift. That's great. So I get the sense then that for Coxeus, the really critical moment in redemptive history is the actual accomplishment of redemption in the incarnation, death, and resurrection of Christ. And until that moment happens, until Christ actually comes, fulfills the law, you know, satisfies for sin, makes atonement, until that happens, everything prior to that is somehow, it's just an anticipation, it's not complete, it's just parasis, but not offices. It's some sort of, um, there's something lacking in all the prior 
everybody living up until the coming of Christ, their experience of salvation is, is somehow lesser or lacking. And it's not really uh, fulfilled until Christ comes. And at, at that moment, then you have the final abrogation of the covenant of works, the final forgiveness of sins, and all of that. Is that kind of the, that, is that where his thinking is driving, is the, the historical reality of the incarnation? Yeah, I, I really believe so. Um, if you look at his, and, and I actually took the table of contents of his other summa, the Summa Theologiae. Now I'm going to start complaining that that's non translated into English. <laughs> <laughs> but, but if you, uh, this is what happens when you study an obscure, relatively obscure theologian for your dissertation. When you look at the table of contents of that, and I actually translated the table of contents of that and put it into my uh, an appendix in, in my my dissertation, the book that was published, because it's really it's really um, revealing. He talks about he starts going into different theological topics, the doctrine of God, doctrine of man, creation, but then he goes right into covenants and he talks about the execution of the testament. So this is grace, but he says the execution of the testament in the first part of time. And then he talks about the beginning of sanctification. So he's talking about the fathers here. And then he says what the righteousness of the fathers looked like before the law and its seals. So he goes into the righteousness of faith, perseverance, assurance, sacraments. And this is all in the old covenant. Then he says uh, taking Israel as a people, so under Moses. And then he goes the promise of the New Testament and preparation for it. And then he has a whole section on Christ's appearing, Christ epiphania. The incarnation, the humiliation, the satisfaction. And then he talks about the first time the gospel and sacraments of the New Testament. And then he talks about New Testament faith, New Testament justification, New Testament inheritance. And this is the, all of these things that are more complete and robust for New mm-hmm. Testament believers. And and I think it tracks very closely with the epistle to the Hebrews. Um, there is a certain polemical moment where we need to say – that it, in covenant theology throughout, what does it do? It keeps our focus on Christ, right? We need to say that all of Scripture points to Christ, and nothing does that than thinking about the Bible in a covenantal fashion. Um, and, and so, um, you know, even from the this early developments in the 16th century through the 17th century, when you think of who his polemical opponents were, again, the Jews, they see no place for Christ, or, or, or a Christ who's a mediator and a substitute in our place. Uh, the Socinians were basically rationalists, and they saw, and, and this is who the Arminians had become by the time Coxeus was really dealing with them, have become almost Unitarian or rationalists. Well, Christ is, this is these are like modern-day liberals, right? Christ is just a moral figure teaching a new law for us. Mm. Well, Coxeus says, no, his blood, his life, his obedience his satisfaction fulfills the pact. It's the whole foundation of the gospel, of that declaration, of the legal declaration. And then the Roman Catholics, he says the same way. They evacuate Christ and his actual coming as having completed and perfected us for all time. And so he sees all other Christians outside of the Reformed camp. He has a lot of grace for Lutherans and others like that. But in terms of these other pseudo-Christian families that he's engaging with, and Jews, people of the book, he's saying they don't see Christ as the center of the scriptures. Wow, that's powerful. Now, just going back on and picking up on something you mentioned earlier, you mentioned Vitzius. Uh, can you put Coxeus's view of the Mosaic economy in the context of some other 17th century Dutch views? Yeah, and this is important because I, I did want to go back to that debate. So the the Coxian Fuzian debate got very heated. Um, they tried to call in the uh, the civil authorities, similar to the Synod of Dort, and it, some people would say that they were close to having an Armenian situation where the Coxians uh, were sort of condemned, um, but that didn't happen. And I think it's very interesting uh, for us to read in Witsius. I see a lot of similarity similarity between Witsius and Coxeus. And again, he's about a generation later. So Coxeus writes his Economy of the Covenants in 1640s. Witsius writes in 1670s, like 30 years later. Um, but Witsius is a student of Fuzius. And Witsius teaches at both Utrecht and Leiden, but he's much more a professor at Utrecht. And so Witsius shows that this basic covenantal schema that has a lot of the elements of republication in it, is common ground 
for both the Coxeans and the Futsians, um, which kind of blows up a lot of our preconceptions about some of those debates. And the other thing that's really interesting about Witsius, and, and I took a really close look at this, is he publishes a number of editions of his Economy of the Covenants, which, by the way, uh, I think the Economy of Covenants between God and man, I don't know if you guys have talked about this on the show before. I think it's one of the greatest English language treatments out there, um, and it, it's it's a wonderful work. It really um, is. Um, but you'll notice he talks about, um, well, in the Latin, it's the, it's the weird doctissimi, the most learned man. And, and he's referring almost all the time when he says, oh, as the most learned man says, and he never mentions his name, he's referring to Coxeus. I tracked hmm. down the quotes. And so he's appealing, he, he's intentionally trying to bridge the divide between these two camps in the Reformed tradition a generation later. Hmm. And he's appealing to Coxeus, and he's saying, this is what we can agree about regarding Coxeus. But there are also these huge polemical sections where he says, oh, we can't do what these people do, we can't do what these people do. Well, it turns out those are added in the later editions. They're not in the first edition. And he's responding to people who have criticized the first work. So I compared the different editions, and all of the editions, and some of them are very, very lengthy, they're major revisions, are going after this group of guys who were known as the radical Coxanes or the green Coxanes. He's going after a certain party in the church, um, led by uh, a guy named Van der Weyen and others. But there was also a Grunewagen, which is a green wagon where we get the, the green Coxeans. <laughs> um, very, very strange, you know, family trees here in the 17th century Dutch Reformed Church. But, but the interesting thing is this is all after Coxeus is dead. So we know that the people that he really despises are not Coxeus. There are certain followers of his who have gone off the rails. And who knows, maybe this is true about Meredith Klein as well. I don't know, right? Um, you, you always get people with a really creative thinker who kind of take some of the insights and run with it and, and go off in an unbalanced way. I think it's always a risk. And, um, and so it's really interesting that we know that Witsius really, really likes Coxeus, really wants to position himself as a supporter of Coxeus's basic understanding of the covenants, and yet also wants to identify problematic sort of deviations off of what Coxeus has done. Um, that's a, a, a crucial lesson, again, for us to learn. Um, and it's, it's so important. I think that this was common ground for a, a, a via media type figure like Herman Witsius at the end of the 17th century uh, to really unite around, look, this covenant theology isn't some – narrow segment. This is really, at least in Holland, at least in the Netherlands, this is mainstream stuff. Almost everyone is on board with Covenant of Works, Covenant of Grace, Pactum Salutis, and with some sense, the way Witsius talks about it, of the weakness, the negative legal component to the Mosaic economy. That's almost universal, I think. So, uh, Brian, you've laid out um, the debate, the controversy between Coxeus and Fuchsius. Um, and, you, I mean, you've really tied that into uh, his understanding of the covenants, but I wonder if there's anything else that you can say about how Coxeus' covenant theology might have been involved in that controversy. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so there are a lot of different levels at which that controversy plays out. And the period I really focused on, uh, sort of the 1650s, the 1660s, the last two decades of Coxeus's life, it's really exploded. And as so often happens in church history debates, the real debate was a, a practical piety question. And so the view of the Sabbath came front and center, and, and that was the whole redemptive historical thing. If the Mosaic economy is a, in the very, again, so you'll hear a lot of echoes to Klein here, you know, anachronistically, but if the Mosaic economy is a temporal, uh, you know, covenantal relationship and an arrangement under certain terms and conditions that's displaced by the new covenant, how do we then think of, of the moral content of the fourth commandment and the Sabbath? And so the, the joke that you'll hear sometimes is that the Coxian wives would sit in their living room windows, which was visible from the street front, and they would they would knit on the Sabbath day. And so they would display proudly their liberty to engage in knitting on the Lord's day. 
and the Futsians wouldn't do this. And so there was this whole explosion, and it tied in with the paresis of faces thing we've talked about a little bit, Sabbath observance, different elements of that. That's the redemptive historical sort of covenantal piece. But a whole other piece of, of that debate was philosophical. If you'll pick up an encyclopedia article, an older encyclopedia article about Coxeus, and I get this sometimes, people say, oh, wasn't he a Cartesian? And so this is when Descartes was starting to uh, publish his theology. He was very active. And Coxeus was, in this sense, a purely biblical theologian. He didn't give two shakes about philosophy. And he just didn't think about it much at all. And the Fuzian party was a very, very robustly philosophical, dogmatic um, um, sort of tradition, uh, stream of the Reformed tradition. If you think of, you know, what we read when we look at like Turretin, right? A very highly tuned philosophical, theological exercise, although Turretin's clearly very biblical as well. So I don't want to overplay that distinction. But Coxeus just said like, Descartes who? I don't know who the guy is. Well, a lot of, Co not so much Coxeus, but a lot of his followers were very then sus susceptible to the Cartesian challenge which was a challenge to the basic reformed philosophical theological framework. And I think because they were susceptible to that, um, they were open and weakened and to a lot of sort of Cartesian influences that tended to weaken some of their view in terms of objective truth and the validity of God's word. So there is a whole philosophical piece of it. And, and it relates again to, um, it's not unrelated to the biblical covenantal aspect, but it, it's it's because Coxeus was just so um, completely wanting to articulate his theology in the language of Scripture. That's why he wants to be so covenantal. Um, he actually, in his preface to his Hebrews commentary, uh, he actually he clearly had a, a fight with this guy named Hornbeek. Um, you know these wonderful Dutch names from the 17th century. <laughs> And Hornbeek was a Futsian who was in Leiden, and 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 he says, well, Hornbeek has sweated a great deal. He has really labored in these polemical volumes he has written. And if you look at Hornbeek, he wrote these huge polemics against Jews, against the Roman Catholics, and similar to the Elenctic theology of Turretin, but very, very dogmatic. And Coxeus says, this is the wrong method. We need to be covenantal and biblical. It's all about Christ, and it's all about the Testaments. And, and Coxeus wants to view, wants to present his covenantal theology as the best polemical theology. And, and that idea of doing polemics biblically really set him apart. So they were debating about that as well. They were debating about the best way to be evangelistic and missional towards all of, of these other religious groups, which now had free reign and tolerance in Holland. And so it's, it's interesting that we, we come back to, uh, you know, not an abstract discussion at all, one that's very practical in the 17th century, but it, it was mostly covenantal, but it also had a lot of methodological pieces about philosophy, about Descartes, about how to respond to various different challenges to the Reformed faith. Oh, that's, that's very interesting. Um, especially for, for me, you know, I studied, um, a handful or so of Puritans, mostly from England. I did look at, uh, Witsius a little bit, but, um, it's just fascinating to me how different their contexts were because yeah. in, in the Netherlands, you have all this, uh, liberty and, um, that's almost the polar opposite of the, the context in England. Everyone was vying for uh, having control of the civil government in order to um, uh, define, you know, who, who got to practice the religion. Yeah. And, and there was, it was a, it was a qualified Liberty. Like um, I actually spent, an afternoon, one of the most amazing afternoons in my life in this old library from what was called an old Catholic church. When, when the Roman Catholics pulled out of the lowlands, out of Belgium and Holland, and officially declared, the Roman, the Roman see declared Belgium and Holland a mission field. They said, there is now no bishopric there. I don't know the exact date of this. 
But there were some Roman Catholics who were still there, and they said, "What are you talking about? I have a church here. I have you know all this stuff here." Hmm. Um, and some of these guys that were still there were were Jansenists, so, and the Jansenists were some of the folks in the Roman Catholic Church who had a lot of Calvinistic and Reformed sympathies. And there was an old Catholic church in Utrecht that a lot of these churches were made to look like row houses. So they, everyone knew they were there. They were openly tolerated, but they couldn't show the marks of a church on their exterior. And it's really fascinating. I spent a whole day in a library, one of these churches. It was a 17th century library. But so, and you'll still see some of these old hidden churches. You can see them in Amsterdam. The Lutherans were there, but they were hidden. Um, so there is a kind of tolerance and there's a relation between church and state that, that's a little bit different than the way it plays out in um, in England. That really does. It, it influences the theology, I think, at the end of the day. Uh, you'll get a, you gave me a great opening, so I have to, to tell you one of my favorite lines from Coxeus. He's writing a letter to one of his really good friends uh, who is a, a sympathizer with the Coxean view. And he's complaining about the other party in the church, the Fuzians, who, if you can't, you know, get it yet, it's it's the more Puritan party. They're more concerned with the purity of the Sabbath and these aspects. And and Coxeus says to his friend, he says, those Fuzians, they're reading too many of those English books. <laughs> <laughs> so the Puritan works were coming over to Holland and, uh, and were viewed as, oh, yeah, there's that sort of English Anglophile party in the Dutch church. And so Cox says very much saw himself as not a Puritan in that sense of the word. Oh, that's very interesting. Isn't that referred to as the Dutch Second Reformation? Well, yeah, that's the thing. There, there is very much a, a Puritan impulse in yeah. Holland that, that is, yeah, the Nara Reformatie or the, or the Second Reformation, the Further Reformation. And one of the things you see the guys doing in the Further Reformation is they'll say, um, you, you know, uh, Wilhelmus of Brockel is one of the great examples of this. They'll talk about uh, the marks of the church, you know, in the the three forms of unity talk about uh, word and sacraments and discipline as the three marks of the church, kind of a typical 16th century reform discussion. And then the further reformation, as well as the Puritans will say, oh, why stop there? You know, we have eight marks of the church, 10 marks of the church, 15. <laughs> the church. And uh, and they're talking about, you know, the signs and, and uh, you know, we see this today in, in the the ministry of uh, here in Wash, based here in Washington D.C., Nine Marks Ministry, right? Mm-hmm. It's a Southern Baptist, uh, Mark Dever driven ministry about what what makes what constitutes a healthy church. Well, yeah, we could have a great discussion of all the different elements that contribute to a healthy church. But the 17th century or the 16th century, the Belgic Confession, when it says, "How do you discern a true church?" is talking to people who are living under the under the cross. They're being persecuted. They're about to be burned at the stake. And they say, you must, if you believe in Christ, join yourself to a true church, even at risk of life. It's a very different debate. And they're talking about a different thing, right? Mm. All theology is contextual at the end of the day. That's true. I'd love to talk to you more sometime about, uh, about what that means when, you know, when it does end up shaping the theology, but we'll save that for another day. Uh, do you mind if I shift gears for a moment? No, not at all. So I, I'd like to ask you about um, theology and your vocation. How does Klein's theology, and particularly his view of civil government, so his whole understanding of common grace, help you to minister in such a highly political city like Washington, D.C.? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. I, um, uh, you know, Klein... And, and studying under him back at Westminster, I graduated in 98, so out in California. Um, Klein was a, 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 a revolution for me as a student. Um, I was kind of newly reformed when I got to seminary, so I didn't have a bunch of old categories to break down. And I, I just, I was entranced by covenant theology, how it unified the scriptures around Christ, how it gave a really clear gospel um, mission to the church, and, um, and, and I, I, I was training for my PhD. I got my PhD on an academic track. So I'll be a little biographical here since it's a biographical question. And uh, by the time I finished up in 2003, I ended up thinking, well, I had some teaching prospects here in D.C. I've taught a little bit at the RTS campus. But I thought I'm also interested in politics and public policy. I had a lot of friends in D.C. And so I moved out to the area to say, if, if a teaching career doesn't work out, um, I will pursue politics. And in fact, uh, from about 2005 to 2010, 
I was um, employed full time. I worked at the Justice Department. I worked for a congressman on Capitol Hill. I worked at the executive branch of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Um, I actually worked for the Department of Defense. My wife thinks I'm actually a spy. I had a top secret clearance. I worked at the Missile Defense Agency. So I, I have a sort of an atypical pastoral resume, needless to say. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, I think sometimes what Meredith Klein says about sort of cult and culture and, uh, and the particularity of the church versus sort of the civil kingdoms and civil callings of the world. I think people mostly hear it when they hear it for the first time as a via negativa, right? Let's, let's get the church off its addiction to politics. Enough with the politics, people. Let's focus on Christ. Let's focus on our ministry in the world and understand that the kingdom that we inherit, you know, my kingdom is not of this world, right? It's a heavenly kingdom. And so sort of the spirituality of the church. And most people hear that as a via negativa, I think it's absolutely important to hold that intention with the fact that there's a positive way as well. It frees us up to do politics as citizens of this world. Now, that doesn't mean we ever engage in our earthly callings apart from God's moral law, apart from being mindful of our spiritual calling as citizens of heaven, sort of a dual kingdoms, two kingdoms sort of sensibility. But there's tremendous freedom when you're able to serve in politics and realize that it is not the work of the church. So in, in both sides, there is liberty, and it's it's really Christian liberty, right, to understand that, that, that statecraft is not churchmanship, that they're two distinct things, not totally unrelated. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I always think, um, when I think about how this particularly relates to our life in the church today, first of all, I have an experience working on in both fully in the civil kingdom in a political way, in a very active and engaged way, and working as a full-time minister of the gospel. Um, and I always think of those closing lines um, from Christianity and liberalism. I'm sure they've been often uh, quoted or recited here, right? But where Machen is is talking about um, just coming to a place and gathering with other saints in a way where it's not a place of strife, uh, but it's a place of rest and, and not not an age of conflict, uh, but a place, um, you know, putting the warfare of the world aside and entering the house of God. And I just, I have it right here, my handy little, you know, it's by my bedside every night. Is there no refuge from strife? Is there no place of refreshing where a man can prepare for the battle of life? Is there no place where two or three can gather in Jesus' name to forget for the moment all those things that divide nation from nation, race from race, to forget human pride, to forget the passions of war, to forget the puzzling problems of industrial strife, to unite in overflowing gratitude at the foot of the cross. If there be such a place, then that is the house of God and that the gate of heaven. And from under the threshold of that house will go forth a river that will revive the weary world. Um, And we struggle with that. DC is a hyper political town and as someone with that background, and I still dabble in politics as a citizen of this world, you know, not from the pulpit, not try not to do it in my, uh, you know, world facing role as pastor of the church, but privately, I mean, I vote, I consider politics. I have a lot of friends who, who work in politics. Um, I'm passionate about it. I, I'm as political as anyone. And so it, I find it ironic when people accuse me of of failing to fulfill my civil calling. In other words, failing to sufficiently activate Christians to rise up and vote for X or vote for Y. And I always say like, boy, I'll I'll go at it hammer and tong once I take this robe off. (laughs) Um, You know, and I I do wear a robe, but um, I'll go at it hammer and tong, but but that's not what people come here for. And and our, our members have really appreciated that. Our members have really appreciated uh, that church is not a political place. Uh, DC votes ninety percent on average for the Democratic candidate. Um, so, as a church planner, it'd be pretty stupid to be a Republican church, <laughs> right? <laughs> just in terms of trying to gather sinners calling on the name of Christ, you know, that would just be a foolish way to go. I'm not saying that I'm obviously not driven by pragmatics on this. I'm driven by my understanding of the kingdom of God and the calling of the church and the marks of the church. Um, but, but people in this world, there's so much fighting. And, you know, 
our current context in the first today is the hundredth day of the Trump administration, quote unquote, um, which is is a joke. Uh, that that definition is a joke. Um, you know, this city, which is a very, very democratic city, you would have thought that, you know, the end of the world had come when Donald Trump was inaugurated. There was a palpable anxiety and apprehension, as there was in much of America. And whether you're for or against Donald Trump, uh, to understand that the church is an institution, it's it's the gate of the house of God, you know, um, and it's needed now more than ever, um, now more than ever. Mm. I appreciate Thank you that. for quoting that uh, that final paragraph from Christianity and Liberalism by Machen. I think you are the first one to quote it on our podcast. So <laughs> that's a lovely quote. I love that. Oh, it's amazing. And since we're talking about your ministry there, um, Brian, so as a pastor and now focusing on your, your role as a minister of the gospel, how do you find that uh, Klein's biblical theology helps you and works itself out in your pulpit ministry? Oh, wow. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. And um, I, I mean, I think the most basic things, right, is as a minister of word and sacrament, I mean, I would say it, it impacts both word and sacrament. And we forget sometimes the sacramental component of covenants, right? But um, in terms of the word, I mean, you know, my primary job is, is reading the word, teaching the word, preaching the word. Um, and, you know, I joked with you guys a little bit before we were on the air that I've taught a couple of different classes for RTS, but they're all basically the same class. Don't tell anyone I said that, Uh, you know, and they all start, I start all of them with, with the risen Christ and Luke 24 um, on the road to Emmaus saying that all scripture is about the suffering and glory of the Messiah. All scripture. First of all, we need to, we need to hear what he says when he says all the scriptures and he's talking about the old Testament, right? Bear witness to me. That's important. But then he says that he must first suffer and then enter into his glory. And so there's this redemptive historical chronology in Luke 24. And I always, I I would tell my classes, look, Jesus was around for 40 days. He could have, a la Joseph Smith, have just, you know, put on some golden plates, a church order. He could have given them a New Testament scriptures. He could have just dictated the whole thing right there. But what did he do? He taught his apostles how to read the Bible. Mm. And when it's it's repeated there in the upper room in Luke 24 later that night, it says almost the same thing in slightly different language. And it really comes through more powerfully there. How do you understand and therefore preach the Bible? So Jesus taught his apostles to be good students of the scriptures. And the fundamental scriptural insight is law and gospel, suffering and glory. And then the punchline of this thing is that if you look at Peter's sermons in Acts, if you look at Paul's sermons in Acts, if you look at the epistle of Peter and Paul's epistles, they use the same language of suffering and glory. They learn their lesson. Mm -hmm. And the time of suffering that Christ on the cross is is that that statement of the penalty, the wages of sin is death. And that, that law component of the message needing to be fulfilled that through the cross we get to glory. And it's such an important testimony about where we are now, right? We're, we're in the time of the theology of the cross, still proclaiming the cross. And in a sense, the consummation is yet to come. It's so important about how we relate to the world in which we live. But so, you know, I would say, you know, Klein and others in the Westminster tradition opened that door for me in a way that I'd never seen it before. Um, but the second part is, is almost as important and it really is the sacramental life of the church. You know, covenants are, are signified and sealed. Um, they have signs. And our sacramental theology in our churches is, in the Reformed tradition, is very covenantal. And we are a weekly communion uh, church in D.C. Um, that's kind of a, still probably a minority position in the URC. And, and there's a lot of reasons that's the case. I don't think it's the, the only position you can have. But I think our Reformed tradition has often done really good teaching a high doctrine of the sacraments and then practicing a low doctrine of the sacraments. Mm -hmm. So we have this pragmatic Zwinglianism running through our blood. Mm -hmm. Um, And, and it's hard, you know, when, when you inherit things, it's hard to, to overcome them. Um, But I would just urge, you know, our listeners, our practitioners, lay or ordained officers in the church 
to, to really wrestle with, you know, the sacraments as a means of grace. And it, it's hard as a church planter. Um, when you start, as we did with 15 or 20 folks in a big city, you, you want to do some big splashy things. You want to get crowds of people. You want to try to get the attention of the world. But for 10 years now, and we started in 2007, for 10 years, we've been focused overwhelmingly on word and sacrament. That's really weird in the world today. That's not typical church life. Um, but we believe that over the long haul, you know, if 100 years from now there's a Christ Reformed Church in Washington, D.C., doing word and sacrament ministry, God be praised. Mm-hmm. Amen. I I love that. And I love how that coincides so well with both Klein's theology and Coxeus's because they both are saying, you know, look, this new covenant that was established in Christ's blood at a particular time in history, you know, 2000 years ago, this covenant is a real covenant and it still exists and we're a part of it. And ministers of the gospel like yourself are ministers of that new covenant and we have signs that go with that covenant. We have baptism and the Lord's Supper. And so that's what the church is all about, is being and, and experiencing and communicating and teaching and living in that covenant. Yeah, and if I could go back, you know, we talked about those five abrogations. The last two abrogations are the death of the body and the resurrection of the body. Um, and... You know, I kind of soft pedaled the abrogations, but here I think there is a little bit of an insight, right? In that, so long as we're in the flesh, so long as we're in our bodies, the covenant of creation, the covenant of works is written on our DNA. As Klein always said, right? We're all saved by works. We're saved by Christ's works, not our own. Mm. Um, and and so the 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 legal impulse, do this and live, is so built into us. That idea that. Where there is the forgiveness of sins, there can be no shedding of blood. That idea, I think, is so important that our sacraments are pictures of that, that we need to see. Right. The, the pictures of the water that washes in a, in a consummate way and the blood shed and the body broken in a consummate way, it seals to us a promise that we constantly are rebelling and turning aside from, you know, we're at, at our, in our hearts. We're just like the Israelites. We're not any different now that Christ has come, you know, we're, we're a covenant breaking people as well. Um, and, and those signs, it's just, you know, the means which Christ ordained to continually wash us and remind us to feed us and nourish our faith, um, that he has finished it all pointing us to Christ and his completed work. Um, just such uh, uh, an important place of, of rest and repose for us and, and, and difficult, difficult as a pastor to rest in those things, difficult as a layman to rest in those things. And it's difficult to go out and live life in that trust and in that confidence that he has finished it all. Mm-hmm. Oh, I really appreciate that. So Brian, um, people are going to, to want to learn more about what you've talked about. How can people follow you online? That's a great question. I'm, I'm not a blogger. I don't really have a, a, a public presence online. We are, um, our church, I mean, I have a Facebook page. It's Dr. Brian Lee, or you can probably just search Brian Lee in Washington, D.C. And there are a lot of Brian Lees out there. There's a professional wrestler who I think is the top Google head. Yeah, I've Googled myself. Um, <laughs> Uh, but uh, so Dr. Brian Lee, but on, on Facebook or Twitter, our church has a page, Reformed DC, um, Reformed DC, and that's um, at Reformed DC, whatever. That's uh, that's usually me posting to those accounts. And so not a lot of activity, but my sermons, uh, those kinds of things. Um, I, I've written a number of, of articles kind of up the avenue of Christ and culture and politics, Christianity and politics. And a lot of those have gone to um, a couple of different sort of DC web magazines. The Federalist.com is one, and the Daily Caller is another one. Now, those those both kind of tend to be sort of right wing magazines. Don't necessarily, uh, you know, present the the view of the editors is not my view, but they've both been very friendly to me and allowing me to reflect on theology and politics a little bit. And you can search and find my name as an author there if you want to read more on, on church and politics in a DC context. And then of course, you know, you can Google Christ reform DC and and find our church webpage, which is very, very out of date. Um, and you know, I, if folks have questions about, uh, Coxeus or covenant theology, 
I'm always happy to engage. You know, you can send me a message on Facebook or whatnot. I, I got a great message from a guy working on a dissertation and he's like, I just submitted my dissertation and then I found your book in the library. <laughs> it's just published <laughs> and everything I said was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I felt a little badly for him, but, uh, <laughs> well, very good. Okay. And, uh, we will link to all those things on our show notes page. Oh, um, great. Thank you so much. Brian, thank you so much for joining us today. We've, uh, really appreciated talking to you. Well, I've appreciated it as well. If you can't tell, I don't get asked questions about my book or dissertation very often. Um, but it's a great topic. And I think now that it's in English, I hope, it's out in our bloodstream a little bit more. Um, and we'll have all the challenges sort of faithfully appropriating our tradition, you know, uh, like, like reading Calvin and focusing only on the institutes. There's a, there's a lot of different things going on with Coxeus and uh, he needs to be put in the proper context, but uh, there's a lot of, a lot for us to learn from the church in this period. It was a, a really flowering age and, um, we're still harvesting that, that riches. Absolutely. Is there any um, desire to translate some of his other works, like his commentary on Hebrews? Oh, yeah. I mean, again, I'm not a translator. I, I don't know of any translation works in progress. Um, you know, I, I know a lot of um, general good classic reform stuff is being done. And I really do think the Summa Doctrinae was clearly, for both historical and theological purposes, the most important thing to get out there. Um I, I have some old little notes, scraps here and there where I would translate some of his aphorisms just because they were shorter and more manageable. Um, but um, yeah, it's, it's a labor that I know I'm not likely to take up anytime soon. Um, and we just all need to go out there and learn Latin, right? Maybe with the rise of classical Christian education, more of our children will be able to go back and do uh, really well-rounded research in the time of the Reformation. I, I, I had a dream, and I'll just articulate this dream and for someone to take up at some point in time, we have yet to have produced a really good historical theological description of covenant theology in the reformed tradition. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I'm a student of Richard Muller, his post-reformation reform dogmatics is a work that reflects an incredible amount of, of breadth and reading. And it really would have to be someone who was conversant and who had spent a lifetime reading continental English, different resources, knew the international discussion, all these things, um, knew the exegetical background of the doctrine. Uh, really, that's, that's what I focused on in my book. If you guys link to my book online, it's horrendously expensive, like a lot of uh, dissertations. Uh, but if you can pick it up in a theological library, there are, are so many developmental pieces. Um, you know, one of the key developmental texts was uh, the sacramental text, the institution of the Lord's Supper. This is the new covenant, right? It's right. a covenantal text. Um, and, and that topic hasn't yet been treated in, in near the enough rigor that it needs to be discussed. And so I hope, you know, at one point I thought if I spent a life in academics and, and research that I would like to write that book. I, I think that's probably not likely, but I'm, I'm happy for someone else to do so. But um, it really needs to reflect, uh, you know, too often people sit down and try to write the book on covenant theology, but it, it's a work of mature scholarship. Um, it doesn't need to be just one person who's a fan of Meredith Klein or one person who's a fan of, you know, Fuzius or Coxeus writing one sliver of the story. It, it really is a historical theological story. And, you know, we believe that covenant theology goes back to the early church. It goes back to Paul and Augustine and Irenaeus. It's not as though it was completely new in the 16th century, um, but this is a topic for a whole other show. I talk about it in my dissertation. There was a lot that was new in the 16th century, and Reformed Covenant theology is, is a huge innovation in terms of how we think about Old and New Testament relating to one another, hanging together in Christ. Um, and, and we have really just started to scratch the surface. So I, I really feel like I'm I'm kind of a piker in this conversation and um, hopefully giants will come along and stand on our shoulders. That's not how that metaphor goes, but um, something like that will happen. Very good. Um, so if any of our listeners have aspirations to, uh, to study these things, um, I think Brian has just given you some, some fruitful leads there. 
All right. Thanks again. Thanks. Absolutely. Thank you, Brian. Okay. Well, thank you to our listening audience for tuning in this week. If you have comments or questions, please uh, email us at glorycloudpodcast at gmail.com or you can tweet us at glorycloudpod and we will see you next week.